Welcome to Know Alive Alaska. My name is Lisa Hiruki Rearing, and I'm going to be moderating today's webinar. This series is a collaborative effort by NOAA Fisheries Alaska Fisheries Science Center, where I work, NOAA's Alaska Regional Collaboration Network, and NOAA's National Weather Service. This webinar series is designed to help you get to know NOAA's work in Alaska and how we connect and work with your communities. NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, studies the ocean and the atmosphere and where the two meet, from weather to ocean to the animals that live around us. All of our speakers work for some part of NOAA or work in partnership with NOAA. We hope this gives you a sneak peek at different career paths you might be interested in. Today, we're inter introducing you to Elizabeth, or Ebet Sidden, who works for NOAA Fisheries Alaska Fisheries Science Center in Juneau, Alaska. And, one of our, and to one of our partner teachers, Mark Van Arsdale, who's the marine science teacher at Eagle River High School in Eagle River, Alaska. Today we'll be showcasing the Alaska Marine Science Symposium, which for over 20 years has been bringing together scientists, educators, managers, students, and the interested public to talk about the latest marine science research in Alaskan waters. In a typical year, over 700 people attend this four day long conference in Anchorage in January. This year, because of COVID, the conference is virtual and there are over 1,500 people registered for the meeting, which started today. We invited Yvette and Mark to talk with us today about their involvement with marine science and how the AMSS has helped to share marine science information. While we'll be talking about NOAA's role in research and stewardship, we want to recognize that we're all coming to you from traditional lands of Native communities who have substantial traditional and local knowledge and much to share with us. In Alaska, EBIT's work is conducted in the eastern Bering Sea from the Aleutian Island chain to the Bering Strait, encompassing western Alaska, which from north to south include the traditional home waters of the Nupiat, Yupiat, Siberian Yupiat, and Anunka people. EBIT would like to acknowledge the traditional first people of the land in Juneau, Alaska, the Tlingit. She is presenting from Douglas Island, which is the land of the Kinedi clan of the Aquan, and I apologize if I pronounced things um, wrong. I did practice. Mark is presenting from Eagle River, Alaska, the land of the Denina. We, we would also like to acknowledge that we're hosting this webinar from the traditional lands of the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish people past and present. A few guidelines before I hand you over to our speakers. You're all muted because we have got a lot of people on the line and we want to make sure everyone can hear our speakers. However, there's a box where you can write questions. We encourage you to ask them as we go, and my colleague Chris Beyer and I will be keeping track of your questions for Yvette and Mark behind the scenes. They'll stop every now and again and answer some questions. And we may not get to all of our questions, but we'll try to answer as many as we can. All right, enough talking for me. I'll hand it over to Yvette and Mark to introduce themselves. Hi. I'm Mark Van Arzil. I am a science teacher at New River High School and a former NOAA teacher at sea. So Lisa asked me to kind of explain just a little bit how I got to do what I do and how I got to be where I am. And the truth is, is I started out as just a kid who really had a great love for the outdoors. The problem was I lived in Cleveland, Ohio, or just outside of it, and there wasn't a lot of outdoors for me to love. That changed for me when during college, I got to participate in a semester with the School for Field Studies studying in Baja, Mexico. I spent most of that semester sleeping on beaches, tromping around islands, studying whales. And by the time I was done, I really had a dream of who I wanted to be and what I wanted to do. And the picture you see here is actually kind of a joke. It was a competition to see who could dress up to be like the best looking, geekiest field biologist. I don't remember if I won, but the truth is, is that that's who I wanted to be. So that eventually left me with the opportunity to go to graduate school at the University of California, Santa Cruz. And if you wanna know anything about UC Santa Cruz, you know that they just have the best mascot ever, the banana slugs. But the truth is, when I was at graduate school, I really actually struggled. I struggled to find direction in my thesis. I had some pretty sharp disagreements with my thesis advisor over timelines and funding. And I ended up leaving after a year at Santa Cruz, feeling kind of defeated, feeling a little lost, not sure what I want to do. But while I had been there, I had the opportunity as part of my stipend to TA a class. 
It was an oceanography class for non-science majors, lots of art students. And I really loved it. And so when I moved back to Ohio, I ended up finishing my graduate degree in teaching. Now I gotta tell you, if you learn anything about finding your way in life, a good mentor is super important. This is Rich Benz. He was my mentor teacher when I was student teaching. And I have modeled or attempted to model many, many teachers in my life, but none more so than him. He taught me how much fun it can be to be a science teacher. I moved up uh, here to Alaska in 1998, and moving to Alaska is an extraordinary experience. Alaska is like no other place, particularly if you're a kid who likes the ocean. It radically transformed not just who I was as a person, but who I wanted to be as a teacher. I'm gonna end with this picture just as an introduction. A couple years ago, I was selected as a NOAA teacher at sea. This is me during my time as a teacher at sea on Middleton Island. Middleton Island, if you're not familiar with it, is an island way out in the middle of the Gulf of Alaska. It's kind of a birder's mecca. And I am literally 25 years later fulfilling that image of myself as that ultimate field biologist, finding my way to a dream in a really different way than I expected. <laughs> Thank but you, Mark. I'm Thank you. Uh, and welcome, everyone. My name is Yvette Sidden, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for joining us. Uh, as Lisa said, I work for NOAA Fisheries at the Alaska Fisheries Science Center in Juneau. But I also came here sort of a circuitous route from the East Coast. I was born in New Hampshire, grew up in New Hampshire and grew up spending a lot of time exploring tide pools along the coast of Maine as a kid. And when I think back, that was really for me when I started that love of science and love of the ocean and just spending as much time as I could, you know, digging under algae and tide pools and turning over rocks and just exploring things there. So if you go to the next slide, Mark. Uh, the next step for me was really then getting under the water uh, and learning to scuba dive and learning to do research underwater was definitely the next inspiration for me. And so after my freshman year at college at the University of New Hampshire, I enrolled in a course at the Shoals Marine Lab uh, called Underwater Research. And I learned to do water learned to do research underwater and to me it felt like the rest was history. Uh, I went on to do scientific diving for the next oh probably decade or so um, and I actually have gone back and taught that course for the Shoals Lab uh, for the last uh, 15 years. So next slide. One of the greatest parts about uh, doing underwater research and scuba diving was that I've gotten to do it all over the world. So it, it took me to the Florida Keys where I lived underwater for 10 days in Aquarius, which is known as the world's only underwater laboratory. Um, and it brought me to Alaska where I started my graduate work studying kelp beds uh, here in Juneau. And from there it took me to the Arctic. So this is a picture diving under the sea ice in the Arctic. Um, and diving under the ice for me was that next sort of aha moment about recognizing climate change could really drastically change these ecosystems that I had now really been a part of. Um, and that ultimately inspired my research that I pursued for my PhD studying uh, in the Bering Sea and the Bering Sea ecosystem, which is what I'll talk about today. Next slide. So where is the Bering Sea? The Bering Sea is located north of the Aleutian chain all along Western Alaska there. I've put the icons of all the different organisms, some of the different organisms on the map there. And the, the shelf of the Bering Sea, which is really the very productive ecosystem for fisheries, is about the size, if not larger than California. So you can think about the scale of how big that, that area is. And it is an ice dominated system. So there are there is seasonal sea ice that forms over the winter and then melts during the summer. And that presence or absence of sea ice is really what changes uh, or sort of sets up the whole ecosystem. So if you go to the next slide, 
just going to show you two pictures of what that sea ice can look like. So on the left hand side is a picture from 2013 and that white that is being circled is sea ice that formed over the winter and you can see it comes down a, a good distance over the shelf there. And we compare that to on the right hand side in 2018 where we had virtually no sea ice over the shelf. So we think of these as high ice years or cold years and low ice years or warm years. So today I'll tell you about the research that we do in the Bering Sea and a, an example of how that research then comes into the fisheries management that NOAA does. So if you go to the next slide, this is just some graphics of of the process from, from the top right, you know, we go out on the boats and we do, we sample in the ecosystem, we sample things like the zooplankton. So in that red circle, there are just some icons of copepods, things that are the base of the food web for everything else in the Bering Sea. We study the fish uh, and then we, we learn how to tie that information to management and, and how federal fisheries management uh, can use information about the ecosystem to inform the quota. So how many fish they tell fishermen they're allowed to take out of the ocean. So I'll go through one example. If you go to the next slide. Again, just some pictures of us doing field work. So on the top, that's a picture of the Oscar Dyson, one of the main NOAA vessels that does, uh, helps conduct our research in the Bering Sea. The map there on the right is showing a typical survey grid for our ecosystem survey that we conduct in the Bering Sea. So each of those triangles is a station where we stop the boat and we collect uh, zooplankton, we collect information on the water, the oceanography, temperature, and the salinity, and then fish as well. So the zooplankton there, the picture in the bottom, just an example of the kinds of different things. So copepods, which I mentioned before, krill you maybe have heard of. There are things you can see with your eye, but they're pretty little, anything from maybe a, a grain of rice to maybe the size of your thumbnail or something. And that really is the base of the food web for, for fish, for seabirds and up to marine mammals. And the, the last picture there, working with the nets, those are called bongo nets, that's how we we put those nets in the water and that's how we collect the zooplankton at each of those stations. So if you go to the next slide, you can see um, after many years of, of researching these uh, zooplankton in the Bering Sea, what we've learned is how they differ so dramatically between cold years where there's lots of sea ice in the system and warm years where there's little to no sea ice. So if we go down the left-hand column there, in cold years when we have lots of ice, what we find is that the zooplankton that are out there are bigger, there's more of them, and they're fattier. I think of it as the trifecta of all these good things that make a good food source for the fish. And we think of them like the Big Macs of, of our diet, which for fish is a good thing. And if we contrast that to the right-hand column there in warm years, when we have little to no sea ice, the zooplankton themselves hold different species and they're smaller and there's fewer of them out there and they're skinnier. So we think of those as like the celery, not a lot of calories, not a lot of bang for their buck for the fish that are eating them. So what does this mean for the fish that are out there? If you go to the next slide, we'll talk about one of the most important fish in the Bering Sea is pollock. It's the number one commercial fishery in the US. And you may have eaten pollock, maybe without knowing it. It becomes sort of a generic uh, flaky white fish that is anything from filet of fish at McDonald's. It can be fish sticks. It is made into uh, crab with a K or surimi that you may have in sushi. So. How do these pollock do when their food source is so different between cold and warm years? And what we found, we studied the juveniles. So in their first year of life out there in the ocean, what we found is that in cold years, again, with that um, higher amount of sea ice, the fish themselves were also fattier and bigger. 
And when they're fattier and they have more energy to make it through the cold winter, we see that more of them survive that first winter and ultimately have uh, more fish surviving to the commercial fishery that's shown there on the picture on the left. And contrast that to warm years, again, um, skinnier zooplankton in the food, skinnier pollock, uh, and fewer of them survive that first winter because they don't have enough energy to make it through. So next slide. That really brought us to one of the cornerstone uh, concepts about how the Bering Sea is structured between cold years in blue there and warm years in red. And it really starts from uh, the sea ice, then the zooplankton being fatter and more lipid rich. That leads to the pollock being fatter and healthier and having higher overwinter survival and stronger year classes for the fishery. Um, and, and all the opposite in the warm years. So skinnier food source in the zooplankton, skinnier fish and lower overwinter survival. So finally, in the next slide, you know, how do we use that information to inform the fisheries managers about what they should be thinking about to set the quotas for pollock? And so I've put in, in the top left, that's just the, the cover um, screenshot of a document that we produce every year called the Ecosystem Status Report. And it encompasses everything or as much as we can gather, all of the pieces of information on all of the different aspects of the ecosystem, including the zooplankton. But as you can see in the graphic on the right, we really try to gather information on just about everything going on in the, in the ecosystem. And so in the graphic, you can see um, everything from there's gray whales and seabirds, jellyfish and crab and arrows next to them. And so we track their abundances over time. And so in any given year, we can say if their abundances are up or down. And in not every case do we necessarily know what that means for all of the fisheries. We think we have a pretty good idea for things like zooplankton that when they're more abundant and fatter, that that's a good thing for the pollock. But we don't have all of those, you know, the ability to connect all of those dots for all of the, the icons you see in that picture there. And that's where I guess I'll leave you to say, you know, there's lots of more research needed in the Bering Sea and, and all ecosystems right around the country that to really understand how changes in any of these aspects of the ecosystem impact our fisheries. And then uh, our fisheries managers, we can help inform them to make the best decisions for our sustainable fisheries. And so I'll pause there. Uh, I think I have a, yep, just a question slide. Lisa, if there's any questions. Yeah, um, so there is one, um, Evelyn had wanted to know how many years have you guys, have, have you been working for NOAA? And for Mark, how many years have you been working with NOAA in, for, on projects? Well, I, I'll go first. So I've been teaching for 24 years. Um, I have been working loosely with Lisa here, I think for eight or nine years. And I met her through the Alaska Science Symposium and her program designed to get scientists into science classrooms. And we've uh, worked, collaborated off and on. Uh, I was a NOAA teacher at sea in 2018, so that was two years ago, I guess. And I officially have worked for NOAA since 2016, uh, but my graduate work was very interconnected with NOAA, um, and I participated on NOAA surveys, so those surveys dated back to 2008. Great, thank you. Um, and Amy had wanted to know, how are you guys both associated with this, the Alaska Marine Science Symposium that's going on this week? And um, what do you get out of it? Okay, well, I would say that I'm a groupie. I like going to it. And I like going to it because I get immersed in science. And that's not something a lot of science teachers actually take time to do, but I find it super refreshing to being a teacher. Um, I've given some short presentations to their educator nights and other things, but I just like going to it. Well, I think that's a great word, Mark. I feel like a groupie of the Marine Science Symposium as well. 
uh, it really is the one time every year where everyone who's doing work in Alaska and marine science gathers and um, and tells the most sort of up-to-date research that's going on for my job with the ecosystem status report um, I almost feel like I'm cheating right I get the way that the the Bering Sea Day is structured goes from oceanography through zooplankton fish seabirds mammals and it's exactly how we structure our ecosystem report looking at every aspect of the ecosystem so I get to learn all the new work going on and all the new connections that folks are working on so it's great great um so I have one I have another a AMSS question and then um Evie has a question about zooplankton so those are the two questions I'm going to ask next so Amy had wanted to know whether students are part of the Alaska Marine Science Symposium. Um, I guess that would be high school students, university students, any other kind of students. And um, why why should students get get involved in science conferences like this? Okay, so I can answer hopefully briefly. Um, traditionally, one of the events at the Alaska Marine Science Symposium is a two night poster session where lots of undergraduates and graduate students are presenting their research. I have, and several other science teachers in Anchorage School District have taken high school students to go tour that, to go watch that. It's, uh, in my experience, been a pretty transformative experience for young people who are 15, 16, 17 to see uh, students who aren't that much older than presenting scientific research. And I know for graduate students, even first year or early, you know, master's graduate students, it's one of the main conferences we really make an effort to attend because again, it's everyone, sort of everyone doing work in Alaska. And so I know the um, North Pacific Research Board that puts on the conference really tries to uh, balance the presentations and the posters uh, to include students and sort of up-and-coming researchers with sort of more established researchers in the field so that you really see sort of all angles of what's going on in marine science. I also wanted, this is Lisa from, from behind the scenes talking, but I also wanted to follow up um, Mark and Ebet's answers with um, the fact that several of our communities up in Alaska have also had students work on community projects and present them at um, the Alaska Marine Science Symposium. So often you get middle school and high school students coming from places like St. Paul or um, other areas, other smaller communities, um, they can get funding to come to Anchorage and present their work. So we have one more question before I'd like to move on. Um, and Evie had wanted to know, isn't the reason that the zooplankton and the krill is smaller is because they feed off the algae on the bottom of the ice. So when there's no ice, there's less food? Great question, Evie. Yes, that is part of the difference. That sea ice is a platform for the ice algae that is the, the real base of the food chain. Um, and it is partially that and partially that leads to then just the whole composition the species that are making up the zooplankton end up being different so it's not just that the same species are smaller but we actually see entirely different species more abundant in warm years and cold years okay great um i know we have more to you you had some other things that you wanted to get to so maybe we'll get through your next session and just for our audience members to know, Yvette is going to be on an Alaska Marine Science Symposium panel at at uh, one o'clock. So we we don't want we want to make sure that we have time for her to present her stuff and for Mark to present his stuff too. Great. Well, this next section is shifting gears a little bit and focusing really on how uh, the Juneau School District and NOAA. Um, partner to do educational outreach here in Juneau. So this first slide is just highlighting the school district renewed their strategic plan uh, last year for the next five years. 
and with it rewrote their mission statement and i'll read it um, because what i want to talk about are these partnerships so the mission statement says now in juno we partner to provide each student with meaningful relevant and rigorous learning experiences in order to graduate diverse engaged citizens ready for a changing world and so that that partner piece i think is really key if you go to the next slide um, the the pillars of this new strategic plan in Juno are here in the graphic on the right. So equity, achievement, relationships, and partnerships. And so I think we are really fortunate um, in Juno to have such great support from our community partners with the school district. Um, and we're able to sort of leverage all of the expertise and supports of the community. And so I'll talk about just two examples of that real quick. If you go to the next slide. Um, the first one that I was or am a part of is called Southeast Exchange. This is a community partnership between teachers and STEM professionals with the goal of bringing place-based science and hands-on experiences into Juno's classrooms. So, you know, many of us around Alaska, you look outside and the natural world, right? It's in our backyard. There's no reason to be learning about it in a textbook about somewhere else, we should learn about it um, in the place where we live. And so that was really one of the main goals of this Southeast Exchange. So if you go to the next slide, um, one of the projects I was involved in now, I think two years ago, you can tell by the pictures, right? These are pre-COVID. Uh, this was a project with Floyd Dryden Middle School here in Juneau. And the teacher, Jessica Cobley, uh, in in one of the quarters of middle school science teaches an ecosystem unit. And so we partnered, she and I, to sort of redesign that ecosystem unit to be all around the Bering Sea ecosystem, because I'm partial to the Bering Sea, and this idea of ecosystem-based fisheries management. How do we think about all the different aspects of the ecosystem and make informed management decisions? And so what the students did in this project was we assigned, we broke them into teams and they looked at six different aspects of the ecosystem. So they looked at oceanography, including sea ice. They looked at zooplankton, fish, seabirds, mammals, and humans. And the humans group looked at both the fishing industry side as well as the community and subsistence perspectives. And we seeded that project with the fact that by telling the students, I think this was 2018, we did this. And in real life, there was an unprecedented lack of sea ice in the Bering Sea that year. So from there, the students researched the impacts of sea ice on their, their particular um, part or component of the ecosystem. And then they had to think about what that meant for Pollock and what they would recommend in terms of fisheries quotas, whether they should go up or down, depending on how they thought the ecosystem would respond. And so the project ended, uh, the picture there on the right is the students presenting to a mock panel of fisheries managers. Um, and I, I always refer to it as a mock panel. In fact, uh, from anyone on the, on the call listening, you'll recognize some of those are actual voting members of our Fisheries Management Council and the students presented their recommendations for Pollock quota for 2019. If you go to the next slide, there's also a program in the Juno School District around artful teaching. And so there was also um, an arts component. So this is one of the student team's interpretation of the Bering Sea ecosystem and each of the six components that they studied are on there with some facts about uh, how their component um, responded to low sea ice in the Bering Sea that year. So the second example, if you go to the next slide, um, I want to talk about Discovery Southeast. This is a um, another local organization in Juneau that is really committed to outdoor education and hands-on education for students. And I can't say enough good things about the ways in which they support the students in Juneau uh, to learn outdoor hands-on science um, in their history, but also especially during, during COVID, of course, when everything sort of got turned upside down. If you go to the next slide, 
This is a, a photo from one of their summer camps. Uh, you can see they were able to offer small cohort COVID friendly um, camps for kids this summer. And again, just a reminder looking there, that's the Mendenhall Glacier in the Juneau Valley. Like to live in, a, I think we're all very lucky in Alaska um, during COVID, right? There's lots of outdoor space to be socially distant and um, be able to get outside still and, and learn. So prior to COVID, uh, sorry, excuse me, when COVID hit in the spring, Discovery Southeast. Um, all educators, I should say, but Discovery 2 really turned on a dime and and started delivering virtual field trips and lesson guides for families. They organized uh, community scavenger hunts for families to go um, and have some activities to do around STEM. And then in the summer, they had these summer camps. And currently in the fall, they're providing lots of educational materials for students via their distance learning platform. So if anyone's in Juno, um, you may be familiar on either on your Seesaw or your Canvas platform. And I'll show on the next slide uh, just an example because our son is in first grade here in Juneau and so he gets the benefit of these Discovery Southeast um, educational lessons. So this is just a screenshot of an activity that was delivered to his class, our son's class on Seesaw about tracking the weather. And so they put together, there's a lesson guide that goes with it. They get booklets like the one shown here in their learning bundles, and then the kids can follow, really easy to follow um, materials for the lessons. And so this was about tracking weather. If you go to the next slide, it's just a picture of our um, actual R journal for our son. And we tracked the weather there the first week in December and maybe a little light, might be hard to see, but uh, we sort of learned the harsh truth about Southeast Alaskan weather in early December. You can see on the right, we had no sunny days. We had no snow. We had lots of rain and lots of clouds and wind. <laughs> so um, I think that's my last slide. If you go next. Uh, yep, just I'll pause again, Lisa, if there's any questions about any of that outreach going on in Juneau. That was that was really great. I like to see all of the the different activities that um, the different organizations are doing. Um, we did have some questions that went back to your previous section. Um, Amy had wanted to know whether this year is predicted to be a cold year or a warm year, and whether there's a warming trend or whether the years just kind of go back and forth on a cycle. Yeah, great question, Amy. Uh, both there is an underlying warming trend, and there is year-to-year -year variability on top of that. So any one year may be warmer or colder, but that sort of average trend, if you looked at 40 years, has been slowly warming. Uh, the last uh, forecasts I've seen for the Bering Sea are for slight cooling. So it's predicted to be sort of an average year in terms of sea ice extent but one of the things that has been happening with that trend of warming is there's a lot of residual heat in the system. And so it's taking longer for the system to cool down and form sea ice. So right now in, up in the Chukchi, it's quite warm and that's where the sea ice sort of starts from, the cooling needs to start from there. Uh, and so that residual warmth in the Chukchi pushes the start of sea ice later into the year. And then it's a sort of a, a race to see how, how far it can extend before the spring storms start to break it up again. So the prediction is for average, we'll see. It's a, it's a balance between temperature and winds, which direction the, the prevailing winds come from. Cooler if they come from the Arctic, warmer if they come from the South. Right. Wow, so there's a lot of different factors. And that actually, we had a couple of questions about the different animals in your ecosystem picture. So um, Jennifer had wanted to know how many fish are caught and um, Evelyn had wanted to know what different animals eat zooplankton, but that could kind of maybe be rolled up into a bigger question of, you must use data from a lot of different um, sources or do you go out and collect all of that data yourself? No, it, well, yeah, lots of different ways to answer that, but whenever I present the ecosystem report, it's it's one of the true times to say I stand on the shoulders of giants, right? There are over 80 people who contributed 
information to the ecosystem report this year. And so 80 experts on their individual part of the ecosystem give information and then it's my job to synthesize how all those pieces are connected. From the Bering Sea, I'll say it, it's interesting. It's managed under a biomass cap. So no more than 2 million metric tons of fish can be removed any year. Um, and we have about 40 different stocks or uh, groups of stocks that we manage in the Bering Sea. And are those fish the ones that, that eat the zooplankton? So, yep, some of them, a lot of the times it's the younger life stages of the fish that eat the zooplankton, then the bigger fish eat the smaller fish. Uh, but also the seabirds are big uh, feeders on zooplankton. Um, they're probably the next bigger, biggest uh, consumer of the zooplankton out there. Okay, and then I have one more question before we move on to Mark's section, and um, that has to do with the scavenger hunts that you described that I think that Discovery Southeast had, had put together. Leon had wondered whether um, the scavenger hunts were on a specific, like you had mentioned Canvas um, as, a, as an electronic platform to put those on, um, but he was also he was wondering whether there were also paper-based ones because you had also showed the, the the notebook that your son had put together. Yeah, great question, Leon. I I don't know for sure. I know in the spring when Discovery Southeast put them together, I think they were available on their website, and the website was in one of the earlier slides, or maybe Lisa could put it in the chat box for you. Um, that would be, I uh, I would point you to their website to see if you can still access some of those scavenger hunts. I will send that information to Leon directly. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Well, um, I think that we can go on to Mark's section now. And Ebed, if you need to go, go off early, um, we'll reserve any extra questions to ask you later, like over email or something. Okay. I'll stay on as long as I can, but thank you again, okay. everybody for joining us and thank you, Mark. Yeah, no, it's a, it's really an honor and a privilege to be on something like this, to be doing something like this with a really well-established uh, scientist. I have to tell you a big part of my presentation today is gonna be why it is that I think I have a really cool job as a science educator and particularly as a marine science educator. So I'm gonna describe a little bit about why that is. So the first thing I'm gonna say is that as a science teacher, I get to expose students to a lot of new ideas, things they've never conceptualized before. The student you see over here on the right is modeling a subduction zone using graham crackers, frosting, and a Rice Krispie treat. This was a really timed lesson, a well-timed lesson, because two weeks later, we got hit with a 7.0 earthquake, a subduction earthquake. As a teacher, I get to really bring out new skills for my students. These are two of my National Ocean Science Bowl teams from a couple years ago. And they had just finished, this is why they're looking so happy, presenting their own written scientific papers to a panel of science judges as part of the National Ocean Science Bowl competition. None of these students prior to doing this had ever written a scientific literature review. None of them had ever presented professionally to another scientist. They all had it in them. I just had to bring it out. I also get to kind of open new futures. The young woman you see in the middle with the red hair, that's Kelly. Kelly's a former student of mine. When Kelly came to my class, she wanted to be a journalist. She was actually organizing the school yearbook, doing stuff like that. But after taking my class, she realized there was a whole new future that lied in front of her, and it was gonna be all about science. She's now a PhD student at the University of Alaska. You can see her in this picture doing field work with three spine sticklebacks. She's looking at the microbiome of three spine sticklebacks and how it may be affected by residual oil pollution. Teaching science is really, to me, uh, more important than ever. Even prior to COVID, 
I think a lot of the major crises that the world is dealing with have answers that may come from science. So here you see a pair of my students trying to understand ocean acidification. They're actively bubbling carbon dioxide gas into a beaker full of seawater and trying to measure the changes. Sadly, I think that science education is actually eroding. Many of my peers who are elementary teachers are telling me that they have less and less time to do traditional science projects because of the pressure to put more hours into reading and math. I've got nothing against reading and math. I like them both. But I am seeing more and more ninth graders come to high school who have never spoken any words or done any kind of experiences dealing with science. To me, one of the great honors in what I get to do is the influence I have on my students. The pair of students you see right here, they're learning how to be a seabird observer, a NOAA seabird observer. Chances are they're never going to do that. In my career, I have a handful of students, former students working as scientists. I have a few dozen students working as nurses, PAs, doctors, like on the front lines of this pandemic. But in 24 years, I have affected the attitudes towards science of maybe 3,500 students. By the time I retire, that number is gonna be upwards of 5,000 students. Those are 5,000 students who are potential voters, who are potential parents of children trying to navigate their way through vaccinations and pandemics. To me, it's a great honor that I get to have that impact on students dealing with their perceptions of science. So to me, really, teaching science is not just about delivering science content. That's actually sometimes maybe the least important thing I do. It starts with discovery, learning through hands-on experience. Here you see one of my students, a very animated student. She's learning about the value of blubber as insulation. Her left hand is cased in a Ziploc bag of lard. It's there to simulate blubber. Her right hand is immersed just in a plastic bag and she's learning exactly how much or perhaps how little that plastic bag insulates compared to the blubber. To me, teen science is really about developing in my students the skills necessary to not just potentially become scientists, but to simply understand how it is that science gets done. The skills of observation, of measuring, of modeling and of analyzing. To me, it's about teaching the process of science. This is a picture I use a lot in my science class. It's a picture that's really important to me. It's one jar from one toe of one net taken during a night while I was out at sea as a NOAA teacher at sea. If you're interested, it's a zooplankton toe, it's mostly euphausids. That net was a Mathot net capable of making five such captures at different depth, maybe six. That night we made five toes in separate locations. That represents 30 jars of zooplankton that made their way when we got back to the University of Alaska Fairbanks. From what they told me, it takes a lab technician about a month to process through that one night's worth of work. That month will translate into one, perhaps two data points in a scientist graph, in a published report. We live in a day and age in which my students can learn anything in seconds. They just have to go Google it. But what I have to teach my students is that the acquisition of real knowledge, scientific knowledge, is incredibly labor intensive, time intensive, resource intensive. Building real knowledge takes tremendous effort. I don't know how many of you have hung around with scientists. I've now gotten to do this quite a bit. And I think most scientists would be surprised to learn that they speak a different language than other people. And I think a big job of science teachers is translating that language 
to their students. This is Heidi Mendoza. She was a graduate student working with me when I was at sea. She was teaching me in this picture how you mass and measure a jellyfish. She's super passionate about jellyfish. She was arguably the most passionate person I've ever met about jellyfish. But the language she used is not something that my students would immediately understand. It's something that needs a translation. I think that kids really need to see scientists as approachable. So starting about 15 years ago, I started inviting scientists to my classroom. And it's now something I really try to make a regular habit of. I think scientists or kids also need to see science as something that's achievable. One of the great things about inviting scientists to your classroom is that they bring cool stuff. But if I was to give a prize to all the scientists who have visited my classroom for the best thing, I'd give it to Amy Kirkham, who's here in the blue shirt. Amy is a PhD uh, student at the University of Alaska Fairbanks at the School of Fisheries. She had just returned from Antarctica and she brought to my class patches. Patches was a sewn together Waddell seal. I think probably none of that students in that class will ever get to go to Antarctica. But in bringing patches, she brought her work with her. She actively engaged my students in measuring the length and girth of patches and then taught them how researchers use those measurements to determine the body mass and health of Waddell seals. She made science approachable. To me, one of the great things about being a teacher is I get my summers off, but I try to make good use of them. Because to me, I learned a long time ago that great teachers have to be passionate learners. We have to keep right in front of us what it means to be new at something, awkward at something. And there's always, frankly, something new to learn. Here's an example. So I've always taught in my marine biology classes commercial fishing. To me, it's a really, really important piece of understanding Alaska. It's a nice intersection between biology and government and industry. But the truth is I'd never actually been on a commercial fishing boat. So a couple years ago, I hooked up with a local small long lining boat and I spent a chunk of my summer baiting hooks. I baited a lot of hooks. I was totally the low man on the totem pole, but I learned a ton about the ins and outs of commercial fishing stuff I could immediately apply to my classroom. To me, that's why the NOAA Teacher at Sea program is so important. It gives teachers the opportunity to live with, to work as, to eat with and sleep with, and be with scientists while they're working. The amount of learning that I did during that program was super impactful to me. It actually really changed my motivation as a teacher. It led me to a new desire to really make science meaningful to my students, to make it understandable to my students. I think these kinds of uh, experiences are really, really valuable, not just to me as a teacher, but to the scientists on board as well. I really try to make a regular habit of engaging with scientists, and I've been doing this long enough that occasionally those scientists are former students. So here you see Morgan Bender. Morgan Bender was presenting last year her work at the Alaska Marine Science Symposium, and she came the day after presenting her work back to my classroom to talk with students. These were students who had gone to the same school she graduated from. It was a great experience, not just for my students who got to see the passion she put into her work, but it was great for Morgan. I think she got a real satisfaction in delivering and spreading kind of the knowledge that she had acquired. I think that understanding marine science is super important to Alaskans. When I first started really pushing to develop a marine science program at my previous school, actually at Chugach High School, I got a lot of flack, I got some pushback. People would say it's kind of an extraneous topic. It's not super relevant to people's lives. People would say, you know, there's not really any jobs in like marine biology or oceanography. We should teach them something more practical. But here's the facts, at least for those of us living in Alaska. 
Alaska has more coastline than the entire rest of the United States put together. If you kind of clump together the jobs in what some people call the blue economy, includes jobs in fisheries and tourism and shipping and resource development, that actually makes up the largest single chunk of jobs in the Alaskan economy. And frankly, Alaskans have more connections to the ocean than many other people or many other places. This is a classic Facebook photo from my wife and I during a winter king fishing trip. And I can't tell you the number of Alaskans who have these same kinds of photos, putting up a picture of a fish, just demonstrating their connections to the ocean. I think after 24 years of doing this, there's a very clear sense in me that we need more science awareness. Ordinary people, kids, need more science literacy as some people describe it. The only way to do that is to really make science education more meaningful. I think we also need, frankly, more science educators. Some of them may be traditional K-12 teachers like me, but frankly, anybody who goes out and learns something about science and shares it with a family member, with a friend, with a visiting relative, they're a science educator. And I think that we need more science educators, whether they be formal ones like me or simple informal ones like my students. Okay, so that's me and my job. So let's open this up for some more questions, if you have some. Thank you so much, Mark. You've always been an inspiration for me in terms of your, your um, curiosity and uh, interest in marine science. And I'm hoping that that also gets translated to our audience. Um, I wanted to uh, um, ask a question from Jody. Um, she was asking, do you or would you consider giving students projects which could contribute data to current professional scientific inquiry? So kind of like citizen science type stuff. Yeah, that's a, a great question. Um, I would absolutely love to. I have had some students participate in some of the citizen science projects available on Zoo Universe, if you're familiar with that website. And so that has a lot of kind of easy to access citizen science projects. Um, it's limited in our capacity to get students out. It's a, it's a frustration sometimes how difficult it is to get students out of a building, even before COVID times. Um, I um, have a stream that's through maybe two miles from our high school. And it took like moving in earth to allow me to get a field trip for my classes down to that stream to see the salmon spawning in them. I think it's something that I aspire to, but I have struggled to get there just yet. Um, I think that, so um, I, I wanted to commend you for talking about who can be a science educator because Evie was um, commenting in in the chat box that she loves telling her family weird biology facts. So I think that, like you say, anybody who learns about science can be a science educator by just talking to their family about things that they might not have known before. Indeed. Um, <laughs> so Jennifer had asked, "What kind? What type of scientist are you?" And I think that um, I think that you are a marine scientist, a marine biologist, just from you know, the things that you've talked about, what would you say? Um, so I would describe myself as a science educator and science translator. So I've gotten to do science briefly, some in graduate school, some as a teacher at sea, which was a super exciting experience. But I learned along the way, in fact, it was one of the big ahas for me spending 16 days at sea, was that um, back in graduate school, when I left, Disappointed, I think, that I hadn't become a field researcher. Moving into education, wondering if it was the right choice, I, I learned that I had definitely made the right choice, that it tapped into me a skill set and a, a real satisfaction of work that I get, I think, much more satisfaction out of the sharing of scientific knowledge and the teaching and the opening eyes of kids than I did ever in generating scientific data. 
So I think I prefer the title science translator as opposed to scientist. Thanks for that clarification. And I actually, as a NOAA scientist, I am very glad that we have you as a partner because that allows us to be able to, to have a place for our scientists to go and to have you translate their science as they're talking to your kids and, and have those connections. Yeah, and I will say, if you happen to be a teacher out there, if, if we have some teachers out there listening, scientists want to bring their research out into the public, out into the community. They, I think, sometimes are a little afraid of kids, but they like bringing their research into schools. At the same time, if you're like a scientist out there, a graduate student, whatever, uh, teachers are super open to bringing in like people who do what they teach and are super interested. Sometimes the challenge is just connecting the two to each other. Okay. It's again, one of the reasons why I always really like going to the Alaska Marine Science Symposium because sometimes it's just about interacting and crossing some bridges that help make some of those relationships happen. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, and I thought that it was very inspirational that one of your students went on to present at the Marine, Alaska Marine Science Symposium and then come back to your classroom and talk about her research. And um, have you had many students who have gone on to into marine science and then come back to, to connect with you? So Morgan was the first, but this year I will have the second. So uh, Kelly Ireland, who is the redhead in the field research picture, um, she will be presenting at the Alaska Marine Science Symposium this year, and she will be following up her presentation by uh, this year a virtual trip to my classroom. That's great. Yeah. I heard too. Um, and and then, I, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. <laughs> oh, I was just going to say, um, I think Jennifer was inspired by your your picture with the fish because she asked, do you like fishing for fish? <laughs> I definitely like fishing for fish. In fact, I think that's one of the real keys of getting Alaskan kids interested in marine sciences is you start with fish. It's a connection point for so many Alaskans. That's, um, and I think that's one of the, the points that you were making earlier when you were talking about the hands-on um, being able to try things out, like whether it's measuring patches or um, looking at the fish that you've caught and dissecting it or something along those lines. Yeah, and I will say as a, a teacher, I uh, um, there was also a picture there just a little bit. I really try to bring in art as well into my classroom. So there was a picture that went by where students were actually creating artwork um, they were creating sketches and then watercolor paintings of fish in different situations. And that actually was an idea that came to me at the Alaska Marine Science Symposium when I watched a keynote presentation about field artists and an increasing number of researchers who are bringing artists along in science expeditions to basically help to document and promote the work that they're doing particularly researchers who are working in endangered species conservation issues. Um, we got a question um, from Jay Wells. He, um, they would want, they wanted to know um, what was the website with the experiment on it. I thought that they were referring to the Discovery Southeast website, but I think that you might have talked about a website with an experiment on it. Is that right? So I mentioned Zoo Universe. Oh, Zoo Universe, right. Yeah, and um, that site has a number of citizen science projects, a wide variety of topics. Uh, the ones I frequently tap into are biological or oceanographic, but there are topics related to astronomy and uh, microbiology and a wide variety of things. So yeah, I um, so for those of you on the webinar, what I'll do is I will put a link to the Zooniverse website onto the NOAA Live Alaska website. Um, and uh, that reminds me that there's also a website called Old Weather 
that has um, that's also sort of a citizen science type um, website where you can look at old ship logs from commercial vessels from the 1850s and compare it to weather from nowadays. Um, so that's another another project that students can can take part in. Um, it looks like we're coming up to the end of our time. Um, so thank you so much, Mark, for um, coming on to our webinar. And, and I was glad that Yvette was able to come on as well. I was wondering whether you could, could advance the slide to our last slide. Oh, absolutely. And thank you, Lisa, for inviting me. And thank you to all of our audience members for being on and staying engaged. And um, I'm really excited about how the Alaska Marine Science Symposium brings cutting edge science to our public. And please, um, we'll have a, a link to the Alaska Marine Science Symposium on our website, the NOAA Live Alaska website. So um, go and check out the talks if you can, and that would be great. So thank you very much, Mark, and we really enjoyed having you on. All right, bye-bye everybody, and we'll see you next week. We'll be going back to our normal time next week of 11 o'clock Alaska time.